Good morning, and welcome to the online worship service of the Salvation Army Lindsay Community Church. It becomes summer later today at 11.32 p.m. The longest day of the year is tomorrow, and then we start on what I call the downward slope to winter. I don't know if you know, but I love summer, but I'm not a big fan of winter. But today is a day to celebrate. It's Father's Day. My father has been gone uh, from this earth, uh, is with his Lord and Savior since 1998. Gone from this earth way too soon for me. So if your father's here on this earth still, celebrate him and spend time with him in person or by phone. Because once he is gone, all you have is memories. And you may be a new father, or you may be an old father like me. <laughs> but whether you're a birth father, an adopted father, or perhaps you're childless, but act fatherly to children, nephews, nieces, um, children of your friends, we wish you a very happy Father's Day. A good father is a foundation in the development of a child's emotional well-being. Children look to their good fathers to show them what love is and to provide a feeling of security, both physical and emotional. But some of you today listening uh, won't be celebrating. You didn't have and, and maybe still don't have a good relationship with your father. Some fathers are not good. They were and are abusive to their children. Some fathers left their families and and maybe started second families, and, uh, and the children have been left with heartache. You've been left with heartache. And I'm sorry if you had or still have a father who was not a good father. But there are many good fathers who have made sacrifices for their children, have been there when they were needed, and have spent quality time with their children. And all of this is wonderful, as sons and daughters need a loving father to provide that security in their growth into adulthood. And our example, the greatest father, is our Heavenly Father who loves us even though he knows everything about us. So whether you had a good father or a bad father here on earth, you have a perfect Heavenly Father. We're so glad you're joining with us and our hope is that you feel the presence of the Lord as we worship together. Even though we cannot be together face to face, but that day is getting much closer. And always remember those on our health prayer list, uh, Shannon Switzer, Major Linda Balmer, Ruth Barber, Jane Sheward, and Lois Bryan. And always remember Morley Danes and Lucy Pelly as they're in long-term care homes here in Lindsay. So keep them in your prayers as well. And please don't forget about the food bank because they are always in need of donations. For the call to worship this morning, I want to read some words from a song written by Chris Tomlin that we will sing shortly and here they are. Oh I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Oh and I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you can provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you because you are perfect in all your ways. And from God's word, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You want to borrow the new car? You want to borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy. Super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ew, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. 
pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Mmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18 is a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing Closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will.
good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Oh, I've seen many searching for answers But I know we were searching for answers. Only you provide, 'cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. Cause you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. Good morning, church family and friends. As you can see, I'm in the building, but we can talk more about that later. The book of James is where we're landing over the next few weeks. So I'd encourage you to read this book carefully and ask Holy Spirit to reveal to you the truths that we find in the scripture. This morning, Bob will be focusing in on just three verses in James chapter one, and I'll always encourage you to open your Bible so or your app. Um, whatever your preference is. We're looking at James chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 from the New International Version. The author of James writes this, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away, even while they go about their business. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning.
This morning, as we prepare to bow and bring our praise, our worship, thanksgiving, our confessions, our prayers for others and ourselves and our renewed commitment to Father, may you experience relief from pain and burden and peace to move through this part of your journey today. Pray with me. Almighty God, creator of the heavens and earth, the giver of life, we praise you for who you are. Your word tells us who you are and our lives try and reflect who Jesus is with the help of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the beautiful weather we've experienced lately, for our health, our breath, the way you provide for us, and the fact that you know our needs before they're even known to us. This is incredible. It's a comfort in our times of uncertainty. We acknowledge that our lives are not perfect and that much of the time we live in a way that does not exemplify your nature. But through the Holy Spirit, we can be drawn closer to you and in that drawing, realize how far we are from you. But that because of Jesus, for us, we can be very near to you when we confess our sin and repent. A life of holiness and sanctification can be ours. This morning, I pray for our global leaders. Many decisions that will directly or indirectly affect us have been made this week. Some we are aware of, like global economic and COVID relief and the environment, but so many more decisions we don't know about. I pray for our country's leaders. I pray for wisdom. Many people are seeking asylum in our country, yet so many in our country don't have their basic needs met for. We think of communities without drinking water, without fresh fruit, and even proper health care. We pray for provision for them just now. We think of the ongoing trauma over not just 215 children discovered in BC, but of the 572 that have been acknowledged, and I'm sure many, many more that are yet to be found. I pray for comfort, for healing and protection for those who mourn. Give us all the ability to walk in wisdom, this part of the sacred journey with people who suffer. May we not cause pain, but be a light pointing to you in a time where many think you're not there. For the leadership at our local levels, help them to prioritize the needs in our community in such a way that there is space for healing and restoration to a full and healthy life, not just what, in, what looks like um, our physical and our mental well-being, but spiritually restore us to you. Help your church to be a part of the restoration process. For our church leaders, I also pray for wisdom, for patience, for grace, and guidance as the world seems to be opening up. Let us be mindful of how to best care for our people. Help those who are hesitant to trust you while wisely looking to those who can guide outside of our expertise. Many in our congregation have needs, Father, and you know each one of them. We thank you for the victories that have been won this week. And for those who have had challenges come up, we thank you that you are ever present and will always be by their sides. Longing to share life with us, you are there. I don't know why such bad things happen. Bad to our interpretation, but I know it makes the longing and anticipation for heaven all the more greater. In these moments, we commit and submit our lives to you. And as Bob brings forth your word, bless him. And I thank you for the wisdom, grace, and knowledge that you have given him to lead us, your children. Father, be with us and bless us today in the almighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Susan, for the reading of the scripture earlier. Um, Today we're looking at James chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Uh, and, and while we're looking at only three verses today, uh, and we might think it's a small portion to look at, there's a lot that's packed into it um, on its own and that relates to the context before and after it. Um, it's challenging us on where we find our worth, uh, what we place our trust in, how we interact in community, it, it challenges us on pride, it challenges us on humility, and it challenges how we see Jesus' ministry was on earth, the focus of, of church, our, our purpose in life, and the list could go on and on because the whole of scripture speaks into all other parts in some form or another. Um, but today we're gonna focus on a few things. 
and maybe some of the others will get tied into it as well. Uh, today's title mentions boasting and social status. And James 1, 9 to 11 focuses in on the contrast between what the poor and rich believers are to boast in and find and where they're to find the security in relation to humility and pride. Um, and it also speaks of what the rich who are not faithful to God often boast in and the insecurity of placing your trust and your boasting in yourself or in things. Uh, well, first, we'll look at why the believer boast in God, uh, we'll look at that as, as a good place to start and to recognize that you first have to recognize what the Bible says about who we are as the human race and who God is as creator to help us understand maybe a little bit more of, of who we are as people. In Genesis, we see God creating man. And while the man is alone, because no other people have yet been created, he is in relationship with God, and this was is what God desires. We have a God, unlike other gods, our God desires to enter into our world and be in relationship with us. Um, but God recognizes that a helper or another per perfectly matched person for Adam would be good because he sees God, that Adam is, is lonely, and God creates Eve. So God says this is all good, and fellowship between God and and man is expanded to God and man and man and woman and God. <laughs> Community between God and mankind begins. Now recognize that between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there had already been love in community uh, without beginning, and we know without end, as the scriptures tells us. Now, at this time, recognize there is mystery about God in his awesomeness, in his holiness that we, can, we can't fully comprehend. And often we're in a place that um, where we trust his word, knowing someday that some of the mysteries that we don't grasp here will be revealed to us when we're in his presence. Um, unfortunately, Adam and Eve do the one thing that God says not to do, and they take authority into their own hands and eat the fruit from the tree uh, that God said not to eat from. And oversimplified, their disobedience of attempting to place themselves in charge of things begins what we would know as rebellion against God, or maybe sin against God, and requires God's just, uh, his righteous and his just nature to discipline them. And this fall from the intended relationship God desired with them carries through to the rest of mankind and to us for all of history in the form of a sinful or fallen nature uh, that scripture tells us that all people are born into. And again, at this point, we trust God as there are things that we can't fully understand. And maybe trusting the creator of the universe is, is wiser than... Uh, making up our own hypotheses from things that we might understand or little pieces that we have and, and grasp and try and try to figure it out. Um, which, if we do that, uh, would be in a way exactly what the issue in the Garden of Eden was about in the first place, taking control or making decisions or conclusions um, from our own thoughts and our own desires uh, where God wouldn't have us do that. He would have us trust him um, and walk with him in faithfulness. Now, the author of James in verse nine to, verses 9 to 11 is refocusing his audience away from trusting in the things they possess because those things could disappear at any moment. And he's reminding them that trusting in God for their provision is partly physical provision, but more importantly, it's a spiritual and eternal uh, position of privilege that they have that they can trust him with. So last week, we looked at getting through trials by recognizing uh, and going to God, recognizing wisdom is from God, and going to God, asking him for wisdom uh, in situations, and that trusting in his wisdom keeps us from being double-minded and going back and forth from trusting God to trusting in ourselves and the world's wisdom. 
we saw that God desires for us to go to him, asking for understanding, but also to trust him for how and when he answers. Because through trials, we can better understand our human condition and how being in relationship with him makes sense of our lives and our situations so that we can endure this life with joy because of the hope we have in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, lacking nothing in our relationship with him. Verses 9 to 11. In verses 9 to 11, we continue the thought on double-mindedness by helping to see the remedy. Warren Wearsby says, It's not your material resources that take you through the testings of life. It's your spiritual resources. Now, we don't have to look too far back um, into our history, just a year now and a bit more, um, to see how insecure our lives can be if we put our hope and our trust in things that we possess, uh, things that are under our control. Um, we've seen businesses fail. We've seen people lose homes. We've seen illness and we've seen and had loved ones that have lost their lives to coronavirus. Um, we've seen worlds that are fearful and panicking and economies that seem to be crashing and, and having great difficulty. And I'm sure that in the future, we're going to see more results uh, from this, the, the situations that have happened this year because of COVID. Um, but in the church community, being a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ uh, changes the perspective of where we put our hope. Um, it also changes, uh, if we think of the scripture today, um, about where we are together, kind of like a leveling out of the playing field uh, of who we are as believers. So we look at, you know, where do we place our hope? And we also look at each other and say, well, how do we work together as community regardless of what, what financial or social status we might have. Verses 9 and 10 are reminding the believers that their position, their value to God, doesn't come from their social status in their society. In the church, the body of believers, those who are following Christ, who have been born again, a position and status isn't given because of worldly status. It's given intrinsically by God. It's not something that we can earn or achieve. And furthermore, if you have high social status and wealth in the world and are a believer, that social status that you might experience in the world doesn't set you above your brother or sister in Christ. It certainly doesn't automatically define you as wiser or more knowledgeable or more deserving or closer to God or more deserving of position in the church society. Uh, William Barclay says, Christianity brings to the poor man a new sense of his own value. He is lifted out of the valuelessness in which he lives into a sense of worth and importance. In the church, the social distinctions which divide men in the world are obliterated. I love that word. And there is no one who matters more than any other. It's the teaching of Christianity that every man in this world, every person in this world has a task to do. That so long as God leaves that person in the world, God has a purpose for us. No one is useless, for every person is of use to God. That's why dignity is in the core values of the Salvation Army. It's not because we have a, you know, a cornered the market on it, uh, but because it's evident to the church through Scripture. We have dignity because we are created by God with characteristics of himself that he has created us with. Because he says we have value to him, and because of this, we have purpose. Notice also that this is addressing both the poor and the wealthy believers in the area of what and who they are placing their trust in. Now, we live in a world that can see global community in an instant. So the idea of poor and wealthy in regard to financial wealth and possessions is ridiculously relative to what community we are in 
while it's also comparable to a world full of different societal wealth and poverty. What we might find as poverty here, somewhere else could be seen as wealth. But the point in James is how things are seen within a society's structure of power and submission, wealth and lack of wealth, security and possessions and lack of security and possessions. And this is being placed against security and position in relationship with God. The book of James is saying to the church, open your eyes, put your trust in God. Spiritually, God exalts the lowly and humbles the proud. And the connection that results in the church is a people that recognize we are in this together. What we have is to be used in service to God. This new birth that we have, the indwelling of God's spirit, isn't purchased or earned by what we do. It's a gift we are offered through God's grace, and we can receive this gift when we recognize and trust it was made possible by Jesus Christ being like the sacrificial lamb on our behalf for our sins. I've mentioned it before that this isn't just saying the right words. It's not us just saying the right words that makes us children of God. It's about trusting in this sacrifice and the atonement that was made possible through it. The being made right before God by accepting this gift of grace. And then in relationship with him, and through the strength of his spirit working in us throughout our lives, our lives begin and continue to line up more and more with God's will in relationship with God. Now, we enter the second half of verse 10 and verse 11, and we're faced with what the reality of life, a life that places its trust in things of this world for security and not in God's redemptive plan results in. Uh, the scripture says, because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the field. Its flowers fall, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. It is the same way with the rich. In the midst of a busy life, they will wither away. Now, Femi Perkins looks at Isaiah 40 and Psalm 49 and Psalm 94, where we read that the eventual humiliation of the rich often attaches to divine judgment. Boasting is often a negative characteristic of the wicked whom God will strike down. Consequently, the boast of the rich might be taken as ironic. So long as they pride themselves on their wealth, they will perish. Then James gives this strong analogy of withering grass, which is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8, where Isaiah contrasts the abiding word of God with the fragility of human glory. James inserts the scorching sun as the agent responsible for the withered grass in the beginning of verse 11. Perkins brings us to the end of verse 11, tying it back to the double-mindedness we read in verse 8 last week. The rich fading away is like the journey or ways of the double-minded. Both lives are contrary to God's word, and the self-absorbed preoccupation with wealth and its consumption leaves no room either for God or for their lowly brothers and sisters. You see, wealth can't even secure life on earth, let alone status in God's judgment. Now we're living in a community of people who God loves and who he wants them to experience his love and he wants them to experience his love largely through our words and our actions towards them. Jesus welcomed the rich into his fellowship. But as Luke 12 shows us, often we see that his message was difficult for them. But for the masses of needy people, his message was good news. 
Grenz draws us into that time and place saying, Jesus spoke about a God who was acting for their salvation, who offered them participation in his kingdom and who would accept them unconditionally so long as they came to him in humble faith, humble trust. His message marked a stark contrast to the teaching of the religious leaders of his day. Those leaders who placed unbearable demands on people, as we can read in Luke chapter 11. No wonder the common people heard him gladly. James chapter 1 Verses 9 to 11 show us that Jesus' message remains the great leveler. The God who reveals acknowledges no socioeconomic distinctions. What this means for us uh, is that as a body of believers, Lindsay Community Church and the church in our Quartha area, um, we recognize that we didn't become born again because of something we did. Being born again is about recognizing we all fall short of God's will. We all fall short of his will for us in community. And that Jesus' message of salvation for the repentant applies to all humans, regardless of social class or economic, or economic status. I love this saying here. The highest ranks in the church are still only servants. Because while we minister to and care for each other, our dependence should only be placed in God. So today, as I'm speaking with you, I wish I was with you. I wish that we could we're conversing back and forth now, and we will have more time to do that as time moves on, I know. But I want you, as I have this week and will continue to do, to think about our lives. Maybe this past year and recognize what the world promises. And place that in contrast against what God, con God promises. Knowing that God delivers on his promises his promises aren't dependent on the circumstances of this life. Let's together be a corner of God's kingdom that recognizes our value, our dignity, comes from him. That all people are valuable, precious, and loved by God. That all need to receive his gracious gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And that Without him, we are all spiritually impoverished. As we reflect on our own lives and on our community, our society, um, let us recognize that our security comes from him. And as followers of Jesus Christ, our security is spiritual and eternal. When we think of and engage with each other, Recognize our place of privilege as God's children. But when you recognize it, recognize it with humility and with thankfulness because we have it through his unmerited grace. The gospel hasn't changed, but we need to understand it, own it, live it, share it. Jesus was the great leveler of people. Through him, we are saved by grace, through faith. Now, I titled today Perspectives on Boasting, Status, and Question. It's good for us to remember that we are born again through God's grace. It's good for us to remember, as I read at the beginning and I spoke on Adam and Eve and the fall and our fallen nature, that we all need forgiveness and God's grace. The difference, the only difference between a child of God is that they've recognized and acknowledged their need and that they've repented 
that they've, in God's strength, asking for help by Him, by His Spirit in their our lives, turned away from a rebellious heart to a heart that desires God to be sovereign in our lives. So let's be a people. Let's be a community, our church family, that looks outward through the eyes of Jesus, presenting his gospel in our word, in our actions, letting his love work through us and into our community as we encourage each other and as we build each other up. God is good. He is faithful. And what a privilege to serve him and what a joy to do it together. Would you pray with me? Father, we think of humility and we think of boasting and we think of your grace and we think of status and we ask, Lord, that you would work in each of us to help us understand more and more as we live our lives and we journey as we journey with you and each other that it's by your grace we can receive salvation. Lord, help us to recognize that our dignity, our worth is given us by you and it isn't dependent on our actions or by what we achieve. But we are valuable to you. That's why you sent your son to die for us because you loved us while we were still sinners. Still in our sin. Lord, from this place of beautiful brokenness, we desire to serve you and honor you in what we do. And this day, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.
for joining us today. I want to acknowledge today the newest Salvation Army officers in the world, the Messengers of Grace, 27 individuals who have committed to serve God through the Salvation Army. They were commissioned yesterday in Winnipeg. And um, in the next few weeks, as they take up their new appointments across Canada and one le new lieutenant, uh, Cadet Tina, she'll be returning to Germany to serve there. Remember to pray for them, for their safety, as well as the many officers that are going to be traveling to new appointments in the next little bit. Pray for traveling mercies and wisdom as they begin the new chapters in their lives. And of course, I have to say happy anniversary to our session, Messengers of the Kingdom. I can honestly say this year is not the year I had dreamed of for our first year. I know I've had many failures and disappointments, not only for me and my family, I guess, but probably I've failed some of you as well. But that's where I'm so thankful for God's grace and mercy as we move forward and as we anticipate meeting together in person here as a congregation. <laughs> Excuse me. I pray for grace and peace in your lives, too. One of my favorite lines, especially over the last 12 months, has been from a musical, the musical Takeover Bid. Some of you may know it. I'm sure Doug is singing the song as we speak. Uh, it says, oh, we've never done it like this before. No, never like this before. And it's so true, isn't it? Many of us have, uh, well, it's just been a year, over a year. Um, but I pray that we don't slip back into the same old, same old that we were experiencing pre-COVID either. God is doing a new thing. The general keeps saying it. The commissioners keep saying it. And he is. We just need to kind of join with him, don't we? We have that privilege as we mobilize and our doors open for us to be transforming influences in our communities. I pray you boldly walk and talk as Christ did, humbly serving your neighbors. Bless you today. If you're celebrating with your father, enjoy. If you're grieving a relationship that could have been, or maybe what was, I pray you sense God's love and forgiveness so strongly in your life that you can extend that grace to those in your sphere of influence who need it. If you're a man, I pray for God's confidence in influencing others in his name and that in your comings and your goings, may God's wisdom be ever present with you. Our benediction this morning is based on Psalm 103. As you go from here, remember this. God's love is from everlasting to everlasting, from generation to generation. Just as Father has compassion on his children, so God has compassion on those who fear him, who listen to his voice, and who do his will. Now go out in the knowledge that the everlasting love of God goes with you. Bless you. Go in peace. Come on, let's make this our confession tonight.
when you record the whole thing and you realize you stopped the recording? Here we go again.